Welcome back to Revive School. Here we are in the book of Acts, Acts 5, Lesson 5. Kevin, we always have a word for uh, the book. What's the one word that points to the Messiah or references the Messiah in the book of Acts? Authority. Authority. As the authority, you're saying, I want you to be in charge of my life. But crazy enough, how that works is, is he says, now that you realize I'm the authority in your life, he goes, now I want you to represent me to other people. And that's really what the book of Acts is. is you're a representation of his authority um, as you walk this thing out every day. And it's funny to me how we can categorize things. Like, I want him to be the authority of my life on Sunday mornings. I want him to be the authority of my life on Wednesday nights and maybe, maybe an occasional two Tuesdays. <laughs> but what we're really saying is, is Jesus, I need you to be in charge of, of everything. And if, if he's not, you know what that's called? A hypocrite. There's no way around it. You either say he's in charge of everything or he's not. And if he's not, you're faking it. And that's really what you have, this crazy story in Acts 5 of a couple hypocrites. You know, if you talk to the lost people, oh, why don't you accept the Lord? Or, oh, why don't you embrace Jesus? Uh, you know, a lot of people just say, well, I'm not going to believe that because you guys don't live like it. The hypocrites, they, they pull the hypocrite card all the time. And so the, the, this hypocrite definition, Warren Wearsby defines a hypocrite, okay? And I'm going to write, the, well, yeah, I'll just write it up there because I think it's an interesting definition. Hypocrisy is you're wearing a mask and playing the actor. That makes sense? And in Acts 5, 1 through 11, that's the case. Two people, okay? Scripture says this in Acts 5, 1. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira. Okay, now here, here's the crazy thing about Ananias and Sapphira is, you know, they're believers. Like there's no question in this scenario. Like they understand the environment and so they sold a piece of property. Well, Kevin, right now, is there anything wrong with this verse? Nope. No, this is a great verse. They sold a piece of property. Now, here's what's interesting. Before we go on to the next, I, I want you to go to Acts 4, verse 36 and 37. You know, Tom has this whole chapter covered. So Tom, Tom's got it all. You know, I love this part. But let me just review just a little bit here, right? In Acts 4, 36, 37, Joseph a Levite and the Cypriot by birth, the one the apostles called Barnabas, which is translated son of encouragement. Now watch in verse 37, sold a field he owned. So Barnabas... He, he sells a field, right? He brought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet. So when you come into Acts 5, verse 1, this is what you're thinking. Does that make sense? This is what you're thinking. Okay, go to Acts 5, 1 now, Kevin, if you would. So Ananias and Sapphira, what do they do? They sell a piece of property. And so, so you right away should think, oh, if we're going to be like Barnabas, what are they going to do, Kevin, with this? They're going to bring the money, distribute it among them because they were all one. That's right. And you anticipate it bringing all of this and laying at the apostles' feet. That's just the mentality. We are, we're one, just what you said. Absolutely. Now, if you go to, um, go to verse 2, however, oh, there's a however. <laughs> he kept back part of the proceeds with his wife's knowledge. So that means Ananias and Sapphira both knew they pocketed some change. And they brought a portion of it and they laid it at the apostles' feet. So some of this looks actually pretty good, but the problem is, is that there's just a portion of this. Scripture continues on in verse 3. Then Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan, how does he know? I mean, how does, this, how does Peter know? Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? I want to check your pockets, please. I mean, that's, that's really what he's saying here. Keep, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds from the, the field? Wasn't it yours? Wasn't it yours while you possessed it? And after it was sold, wasn't it at your disposal? Why is it that you planned this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Whoa, I mean, he's pretty drastic here. Verse 5, when he heard these words, Ananias dropped dead. Yeah, and a great fear came on all who, who heard. <laughs> okay. It's kind of like, where do you start, right? One is, how did Peter know? One, I'm just going to tell you, I think he's walking in the authority. He's being sensitive to the Holy Spirit of these gifts that the Spirit of God has given him. He has the gift of discernment. He understands the environment, and he calls out Ananias. And because of that, they're fellow believers, he honestly can speak into them. And Ananias thought he could actually fake giving up certain things. And let's just call it out. Hypocrisy is so that you could set the stage so that you could look good. 
Ananias just wanted to look good in this environment. Now, look what it says, though. Why has Satan filled your heart? Man, that, Kevin, that's pretty drastic. If all of a sudden you said to Clayton, hey, Clayton, Clayton what's the deal? Why has Satan filled your heart? Like, whoa. Clayton's like, dude, I'm a believer. What are you talking about? But I mean, this is how direct Peter speaks with authority. We've been talking about this authority deal, right? That's the big thing for me. And like, remember just a couple chapters ago, Peter, what does he say to the lame man? He says, get up and walk. He speaks with authority. Now in verse three, he's radically speaking with authority again. And he doesn't want this baggage in the church. And so he calls it out. And he says, why has Satan filled your heart? Now you can say, well, how is that even possible? Okay, I want to kind of walk through a little bit here. God's children, okay? And I think this is pretty accurate. Nelson says this. This, is, this makes it clean for me. God's children who have been freed from the tyranny of Satan have the ability to choose when and who they will allow to control them. Would you agree, Kevin? Yeah. Even though as a child of God, you can wake up today and you could say, I would like to follow Satan. Could you do that? It's, it's part of our choice. We still, God gives us choices. I don't know. I, some people might disagree with this, but like I know I'm a child of God, but literally the door is right here and Satan is crouching outside of it. I could give in to that temptation. I could give in to those things. I don't know. Clayton, would you agree? Do you agree that you could at one point actually turn against God and go to the enemy, even though you're a child of God? Definitely. I feel like we all do that at some point. You said that kind of a little too excited. Yeah. Like, yes, <laughs> we're not proposing that just for the record. <laughs> I mean, it's true, though. We all have a decision. We all have a choice. When we choose to sin, as Nelson says, we open the door to Satan. And the evil one is constantly tempting each one of us, just like he tempted Ananias and Sapphira. And he just puts these little thoughts. Hey, you could, you know, if you keep some of these proceeds, you could get a bigger hut, you know? Well, I don't know. Back then, what would you call them? Houses? Adobes? Hey, you could get a bigger adobe, maybe. So you get the point. <laughs> Uh, you get the point, right? The point is, is that they yielded their will to these temptations. So not only does he say, hey, by the way, why has Satan filled your heart? But look what he said. He says you to lie to the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's an interesting phrase to me. But when you go to John 8, 44, if you would, and John 8, 44 says, you are of your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has not stood in the truth because there is no truth in him. So Ananias, if he's filled his heart with Satan, that sounds so drastic, then there's no truth in him. And when there's no truth, when he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he's a liar and the father of liars. So naturally, if your heart is filled with Satan, you're going to you're going to not tell the truth. You're going to actually tell lies and you're going to speak against the truth of the Holy Spirit. I know this sounds obvious, but you guys, when you open up these doors to these little things, I mean, for all we know, Ananias and Sapphira, they've been working on this system. They've been working. You don't just radically just say, hey, I'm going to do this. Like, it's a process to get to this point. Interesting enough, when it says, when they deliberately lied, they took upon themselves the moral character of the one. This is crazy. Who is, yes, um, behind the lies, the devil himself. They literally became the moral character of, of Satan. And he calls them out and he says, you've been lying to the spirit and you've been testing the spirit. Now the opposite is, is that your heart is supposed to be filled with the, with the truth. Kevin, you'll like this quote. Oliver Wendell Holmes. You know who that is? New guy again. New guy in. Sin has many tools, but a lie is the handle which fits. And I like that because I feel like, you know, the lying is, it's just like it's, man, you can make whatever works. You know that, right? If you lie. Now, granted, it will always catch up with you. So here you have Ananias. Well, colossal failure because he dropped dead. <laughs> I mean, like, just boom, dead. And a great fear came on all who heard, like, holy cow, what happened? Like we know Ananias. And then in verse six, and this is where it gets weird. The young man, they got up, they wrapped up his body, they carried him out and they buried him. Like, okay. Now granted, uh, funerals were very fast in that, con in that culture. So that's not the issue. But just the fact that they're moving it along and hey, maybe we should invite the wife. Verse seven, there was an interval of about three hours. So by the time the burial takes three hours, his wife came in, Sapphira, not knowing what had happened. Hey, I wonder where my husband is. And tell me, Peter asked, what a setup question by Peter. Man, Peter's determined. Did you sell the field for this price? 
Well, yes, she said, for that price. Then Peter said to her, why did you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Like, why are you challenging God? Uh, and he says, look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. If I'm the wife, I'd be like, what? What did you just say? And instantly she dropped dead at his feet. Normally we talk about people that walk in authority. You know what we talk about? They're bringing them back to life, not killing them. Like when's the last time you heard about, hey, speaking of authority, they're going to die. It's not an encouraging message, but I'm telling you guys, Peter walks with a ridiculous authority. I'm going to walk you through why I think this happened. But until then, when the young men came in, they found her dead. Well, got another one. I mean, what are you supposed to say? They found her. This is the earlier days of the funeral home. They found her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And then in verse 11, then great fear came on the whole church and on all who heard these things. Why, Kevin? Why does fear creep into the whole church? That implies Ananias and Sapphira were a part of the whole church. I think, I think it's a, uh, it, well, it, they would have heard what had happened when they went ahead because they were together for one thing and they were distributing the funds among themselves. So I think the fear would have been just the reality of even the smallest little things. Yeah, like you know word spread. Like, hey, did you hear they tried to, teach, to cheat the church? Hey, they only gave 8%, not 10%. You know, like, I mean, that's kind of the language. Hey, did you hear such and such? And it just starts spreading. Uh, <laughs> this is really interesting. At the beginning of a new uh, time period in salvation history. So every time God decides to move into a different area of revealing himself. Let me give you an example, okay? When the tabernacle was erected, okay? Do you remember the story about Nadab and Abihu? Do you remember this? They presented false fire. What happened to Nadab and Abihu? Dead. So when we're, in, when we're integrating here, uh, like the new tabernacle mentality, like guess what? You are automatically dead. Now think about this, okay? Let's go to the next one. What about when they walked into the promised land? Okay, so here you have the tabernacle dead, right? These two guys, Nadab and Abihu. Don't, don't mess with the system that I'm trying to reinstate as something pure and holy. Now, all of a sudden, I keep going over here because like, I'm expecting Joshua's paintings right now, Kevin. Okay, when they walk into the land, what about Achan? Remember Achan in Joshua 7? He was killed for disobeying orders after Israel entered the promised land. So it's almost like every time God is, is revealing himself in, in a new and a fresh way, just to make sure everybody says that they, they know that they're not supposed to mess how God has put the system, he kills them if they're not honoring and walking this out. And it's always the first two. Like it's the first person. You know, does that make sense? And so here you have, think about this. Just when we have re, uh, not reinstated. In fact, Kevin, go to Acts 2. I'm going to kind of, I'm going to go back here for a second. I want you to go to Acts 2 verse um, Really, let's go to verse 42. Remember, after 3,000 people, it says in verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So this whole church mentality, what were they doing? They were teaching the fellowship, the breaking of the bread, and to what? The prayers. Then fear came over everybody. Many wonders and signs were taking place. In verse 44, look, now all of the believers were together and they held all things in common. In verse 45, it says, they sold their possessions and property and distributed their proceeds to all as anyone had a need. And so this took place every day. They devoted themselves in meeting together in the temple complex and broke bread from house to house. They ate food with a joyful and humble attitude, praising God and having favor with all the people. And every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. This was the process for the church. You literally sold and gave everything to make sure everybody else's needs are being met. When Ananias and Sapphira decide to cheat the original system for the church, God says, no, I'm going to show you don't mess with this system. As crazy as it is, and guess what? He used the authority of Peter to actually have them die. I mean, Peter had to actually say, like, and walk this thing out. He called them out on this. I don't know, Kevin, when I, when I hear this and God's put something new in place, what I hear is, don't touch it. Don't mess with this. Because I am asking you to be holy and separate and distinct. 
and he kills these people. Man, it's, it's really ridiculous. And in verse 12, as a result, look what it says. And many signs and wonders were being done among the people through the hands of the apostles. It's kind of an interesting transition, to be honest. Because up until this point, the only thing that we've seen that the apostles have done, I mean, in, verse, in chapter 5, is that they died. Somebody died. Two people died. So now he says, many signs and wonders are being done among the people through the hands of the apostles. By common consent, they would all meet in Solomon's colonnade. So, Kevin, you guys have, have used this picture before. So where does the first church, where do the first group of believers actually start meeting on a consistent basis? In Solomon's colonnade, at a porch, at the portico, on the Temple Mount. Now, when you go there today, um, you can. You, you, there's no, there's there's nothing here, but I always I always walk over there and say this is where it would be. It's just kind of cool to think that this is where the group of the first century believers started to gather. And why? Because signs and wonders were taking place. And then in verse 13 it says, "But none of the rest dared to join them, but the people praised them highly." And believers, in verse 14, were added to the Lord in increasing number, crowds of both men and women. All right, so here's what you have, just to have a, a quick snapshot, right? So in the first 11 verses, okay, you're going to see hypocrisy of Ananias and Sapphira. And I wanted to write this out, uh, and I like how Wearsby breaks this down, because I want to show you how all of this leading. Many can actually function in the state of the hypocrisy. Looks good, they're part of the church, they're just trying to cheat the system. I, I don't know how else to say this. Can I just tell you, I have no skin in the games for saying this. I don't know why people would not give uh, at least a minimum of 10% to the church. I really don't. Like, I'm not, I have, there's no reason for me saying this except, you guys, what God has given us, we got to pour back into the church. What God has given us, we got to pour back into those that need it so that we can continue to advance the kingdom of God. And it might just be your local congregation that you can radically, so, radically slow into, but you might be holding on to some. Like, it's God's money. You can never outgive God. And the hypocrisy that Ananias and Sapphira showed is they tried to cheat God with the money. They were lying to the Holy Spirit. And literally the scripture says that their heart was filled with Satan. Now, that's super drastic. But I want to just show you that's the extreme of somebody who does not walk in the authority that God's given them. But now I want you to see the authority when you walk it out of the ministry of the apostles. The ministry of the apostles, and that really goes through from uh, verses in this context, verses 12 through 16, the ministry of the apostles. So all these signs and wonders are taking place. Their numbers in verse 14 are being added. This is the first time that Luke actually says salvation has come to women. Okay, just a random little comment here. You have men, but the first time you're going to see salvation come to women in, in, in Luke's writings. And then in verse 15, as a result... Of all of these people being added uh, to, to the numbers, look at this. They would carry the sick out into the streets, lay them on beds and pallets, so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. We can think this is a ridiculous story. I, I'm telling you what, you guys. I believe when you walk in the authority that he's given us, based on the Holy Spirit and uh, the truth, God can do anything He wants. God can bring healing however He wants. Obviously, whatever He had, somebody wanted. Whatever He had, they were like, you know what, I, I, I kind of actually, I like that. And in verse 16, it says, In addition, a large group came together from the town surrounding Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits. And look, well, what was their percentage of how many people got healed, Kevin? What does it say? And they were oh. all healed. All were healed. The only thing I can conclude is this man walked in such ridiculous authority from what he learned through his, yes, Master Christ, he actually got to walk this out. Now, you guys remember, um, Jesus said we could do anything greater. We could do greater things than him. And so there might be some things that we've never seen before, but it doesn't mean that it's, it's wrong. And so here you have the hypocrisy of Ananias and Sapphira just trying to get away with something. And Peter's like, man, what more can I do for the Lord? Like to me, that's the posture that I long 
I long for. I like this. Uh, you know, we're talking about the signs and wonders. And I think Wearsby says it's pretty, pretty clear. What's, what's the deal with the signs and wonders? What's the deal with, with the healings? Why, why do we have to experience some of these things? And here's one of them. One is, it's just to show compassion and meet their needs. Like all of these sick people, just if you care for them, you'll actually love on them. And then number two, it presents the credentials of the Son of God. And then number three, it actually conveys a spiritual truth. I like this layers. It shows compassion and it meets a human need. And then it shows the credentials of uh, Jesus being the Son of God. And then it conveys a spiritual truth. So these are the kind of components. An example would be the feeding of the 5,000. Okay. One is, is, I mean, it's ridiculous. You have to feed 5,000 people and guess what? It happens. But in that, Jesus sh is shown as being the Son of God. And at the same time, he gets to talk about the bread of life. So as we're walking through these signs and wonders, as we're walking through these healings that sometimes you can't describe, just kind of use that as your gauge when you're walking out this ministry. Now it says in verse 17, and I think to me this is the fun part of the whole, the whole lesson. It says, then the high priest took action. I, I think there's a comparison here. I really think there's a comparison. I think that we're saying, look how one group of believers acts and then look how another group of believers acts. And then you get to decide which one you want to walk out. And then it says, and the high priest took action. Okay, so the took action is, is everybody is starting to see, you know, the disciples are pointing people to the Lord. And so he and all of his colleagues, those who belonged to the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. As it's rooted in pride. Verse 18, so they arrested the apostles and they put them in the city, the city jail. And then watch this in verse 19. But an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail during the night, brought them out and said this, go and stand in the temple complex and tell the people all about this life. He doesn't say uh, leave and run for your lives. He actually says, I want you to go back into the temple where you were first arrested and I want you to keep preaching about me. I just think it's an absolutely bizarre angel that says this. Why, why would an angel? Because they have work to do. Do you remember what Acts 1.8 says? Because you're supposed to be my witness. And if you're my witness, are you willing to die for me? Here, honestly, you guys, is the first test. Do he, does he and is he willing? And look, in verse 21, he doesn't even flinch. In obedience, this group of disciples, they entered the temple complex at daybreak and then they began to teach. Kevin, at daybreak, we're talking like, let's go. Like, we're not talking about, hey, let's wait until, you know, noon. No, no, no. We're going to go and we're going to start preaching the word. And when the high priest and those who were with them arrived, they convened the Sanhedrin, the full senate of the sons of Israel, and they sent orders to the jail to have them brought. Well, the problem is these religious dudes, they don't even know that they're not even there. And in verse 22, scripture says, but when the temple police got there, they didn't find them in the jail. So they returned and reported, hey, psh, we have some escapees. <laughs> and in verse 23, we found the jail securely locked, guards standing out there in front of the doors. But when we opened them, nobody's inside. I think they're confused. In verse 24, it just says, as the, ca <laughs> as the captain of the temple police and the chief priests heard these things, they are baffled. Hey, what, where did they go as to what could come of this? How could this happen? And then in verse 25, look, the men you put in the jail, they're not here. They're teaching the people. And in verse 26, it says, the commander went with the temple police. He, I, I love this. These, these guys are literally chicken littles. The captain went with the temple police and he brought them in without force because they were afraid that people might stone them. Hey, I, I need some help. We need to gather these guys. Hey, why did you leave? <laughs> Didn't we strictly order you to not, as scripture continues on, Kevin, if you can, uh, keep going here for me. Didn't we? <laughs> Then we strictly ordered to you to not teach in this name. They can't even say his name. And look, you filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you're determined to bring this man's blood on us. You keep accusing the Jews, the leaders, the religious that we're the ones that have killed him. And I love Peter. Here he goes. You wonder if he just had his hands crossed. I don't know. Peter and the apostles, they replied, we must obey God rather than men. And in fact, he's not done talking. He says, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging him on a tree. Now he's just calling him out. And God exalted this man to his right hand as a ruler and savior. Boom, there he goes again. To grant repentance to Israel 
and forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. And when they heard this, what happens is this. When you speak, can I just say this? I understand the component of gentleness. I understand the component of truth. But there's something about men and women of God when they speak with authority. It says the religious were enraged and they wanted to, to kill them. And so finally, in verse 34, a religious dude, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, at one point, just so you know, he taught Saul, actually, a highly respected Pharisee, uh, respected by all. He stood up in the Sanhedrin and he, here's what he did. He ordered the men to be taken outside for a little bit. And he said to the men of Israel, be careful about what you're going to do to these men. In verse 36, not long ago. And then he gives two examples of Thutius. And then he gives another example of Judas the Galilean. And basically, as they went and attempted to have a movement, the men joined them. It didn't last. That's really what you see. And then he says in verse 38, and now I tell you, stay away from these men and leave them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it's of God, you better not touch this. You will not be able to overthrow them. You may even be found fighting against God. So they were persuaded by him. And here's what I love, you guys. After they called in the apostles and had, had them flogged. First time you see actual persecution in the book of Acts. Had them flogged. They ordered them not to speak shh. In the name of Jesus, don't you think this is interesting, you guys? You cannot say the name of Jesus, and then they, they release them. And this is the coolest part. It says in verse 41, Then they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be dishonored on behalf of the name. And every day in the temple complex, even after they were told not to. And in various homes, they continued teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Every single day, they literally said, I am willing to suffer for the sake of Jesus Christ. So what's the difference between Ananias and Sapphira and Peter and the disciples? I think they're actually willing to give up their life. The problem is, is Ananias and Sapphira died and Peter and the disciples continued to move on. You know, Matthew 5, 10 through 12, Jesus says, by the way, these things are coming. When you walk in my authority, those who are persecuted, it says for righteousness are blessed for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Verse 11, you are blessed when they insult you and persecute and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. In verse 12, be glad and rejoice. There it is, because your reward is great in heaven for that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Here's the big question. And I think it's a legit question to ask the church. Who am I really? Am I Ananias and Sapphira or am I Peter and the disciples? It's a simple question. You can say, man, it's pretty forward, but it's real. We cannot have hypocrites in the church. We need the Peters and the disciples that are willing to walk in the authority that he's given us. No more masks. If you feel like you're wearing a mask, take it off and ask for forgiveness because he can redeem and restore any one of us to walk in his authority. All right, guys, have a great day and we'll talk to you tomorrow.